4.12 Chula Vyuha Sutta Somebody asked the Buddha Some who abide strictly to their own views alone come into dispute with others each claiming that they themselves are the only experts declaring thus One who understands this knows the truth Whoever rejects this is imperfect So having thus got into arguments they dispute amongst themselves They say the other person is a fool, not an expert. Since one and all are expert talkers, which is the true statement out of these? And the Buddha said, If one who does not tolerate another's view is a fool, a dull and stupid, then all of them are fools without understanding, because all of them abide by their own views only. If by reason of one's view, one becomes pure, pure in wisdom, expert and intelligent, then there is none among them who is of inferior wisdom, for they all equally arrive, for they have all equally arrived at dogmatic views. I do not say that whatever the fools separately advocate is true. They make their own individual views true. Therefore, they determine that another person is a fool. The man asked again, What some say is true and real, others say is empty and false. Thus they come to conflict and debate. Why do the recluses not propound one doctrine? And the Buddha said, The truth indeed is indeed one, and the knower of it does not dispute it. There is not a second view. Because diverse truths are proclaimed, the ascetics do not say one and the same. And the Buddha and the questioner asked again. Why do the disputants who assert themselves to be the experts proclaim truths so diverse? Are there in reality diverse truths, or are they following their own reasoning? And the Buddha said, There are not many diverse truths in the world, except those which are surmised by faulty perception. Assuming mere sophistry in their views, they claim a duality. This is true and that is false. The fool depends on what is seen, heard, or cognized and rules and and rituals, and looks down upon others, saying, The other person is a fool, an imperfect one, making his own judgment and being happy with it. Just because one who thinks another is a fool and therefore calls himself an expert, such a person who calls himself an expert insults himself and others. The one who is full of rigid, fixed views, puffed up with pride and arrogance, who deems himself perfect, becomes anointed in his own opinion because he holds firmly to his own view. If one becomes low by another's word, one becomes one of low wisdom along with the other. And if on one's own, one becomes learned and wise, then there is none among recluses who is a fool. Those who proclaim a doctrinal view different from this have misunderstood. Thus the heretics Heretics proclaim many diverse views because they are attached to their own views. Those who are attached to their own views maintain that purity of view is with them, and they deny purity of view in other doctrines. Thus these heretics are deeply attached to their own views. The heretic who maintains firmly that his own view is right, who else would he brand a fool? He who calls others fool and holder of impure doctrine would indeed invite strife. Standing rigidly to his own view and depending on his own criteria, he enters into dispute in the world. Desisting from all theories, the wise one does not enter into dispute in the world. Hmm, all about disputes. Eh? Next sutta also. 4.13 Mahavyuha Sutta Those who, adhering to their views, dispute this only is the truth either bring blame upon themselves or obtain praise thereby. The result of the praise is trifling and not enough to bring about tranquility. I say there are two results of dispute, victory or defeat. Having seen this, let no one dispute, realizing Nibbana where there is no dispute. The wise one does not embrace all those views that have arisen amongst worldly people. Should he who is free from views Be pleased with what has been seen and heard, and remain dependent on them. Those who consider moral practices to be the highest say, Purity comes to restrain, 
having undertaken a holy practice, let us train in it whereby purity comes. But those so-called experts are still immersed in samsara. If he falls away from moral conduct and holy practices, he trembles, having failed in his action. He longs here for purity, like a traveller who has lost his caravan while he is away from his home. Having abandoned formal religious practices altogether, and actions both good and bad, neither longing for purity nor impurity, he wanders aloof, abstaining from both, without adhering to either extreme. Practicing loathsome penances or adhering to what has been seen, heard or thought, they praise, they praise purity in high voices, but they are not free from craving for recurring existence. For him who desires, more desires result. He trembles, deluded by imaginary views. For him who has overcome death and birth, why should he tremble and what would he yearn for? What some regard as the highest view, others consider to be worthless. They all claim to be experts. Which of them indeed is right? Each one claims that his own view is perfect and that the belief of others is inferior. Thus they enter into dispute. Thus each of them says that his own opinion is true. If a, be if a view becomes worthless because it is censured by others, then no one will be distinguished because each one firmly regards another's view as low, whilst one's own alone is regarded as true. Just as they honor their views, likewise they praise their ways. If all their views are true, then their purity must also be peculiar to them. To the noble one, there is nothing to be derived from others, nothing to embrace after investigation of doctrines. He therefore has transcended disputation, for he does not see another's view as the best. I know and see this is just so. Thus saying, some claim purity through that view. What is the point in saying that one has seen the truth if rival views are put forward? The man sees mind and matter, and having seen, he takes them as permanent. Let him see either much or little, for experts do not say, purity comes by that. Not easy to discipline the dogmatist who says this is the truth, being misguided by views. Saying that good is in such preconceptions is given to saying that purity is inherent as he has so seen. The noble one, having perceived things through knowledge, does not enter into speculations. Having learned of diverse theories that have arisen among others, he is indifferent to them, whilst others labor to embrace them. The sage being freed from worldly ties, remains peaceful among the restless. He is indifferent among sectarian squabbles, not embracing them whilst others remain attached. Having abandoned former defilements, not inducing new ones, not becoming partisan, he is free from dogmatic views. Being wise, he neither clings to the world nor blames himself. By overcoming all the theories based on seen, heard, or thought, he is a sage who has released his burden and is liberated, not imaginative in views, not aspiring for anything. So said the Buddha. Okay, the next sutta is 4.14, Tuva Taka Sutta. Master of wisdom, descendant of the sun, said a questioner to the Buddha. I wish, I wish to question you about the state of peace, the state of solitude and quiet detachment. With what manner of insight does a monk become calm, cooled, and no longer grasps at anything? And the Buddha said, He achieves this by cutting out the root obstacle, the delusion. He eradicates all thought of I am. By being mindful all the time, he trains himself to let go of all the cravings that arise in him. Stop here for a moment. Uh, this thought, I am, is the bhava, uh, being, uh, because of attachment, uh, that self, uh, I am, uh, arises uh, because of strong craving and attachment. Uh, 
whatever he may understand inwardly or outwardly, he has to avoid becoming proud of his convictions. For good men have said that this is not the state of calm. He has to avoid thinking of himself as better or worse than, or equal to anyone. Coming into contact with various things, he should not embellish the self. The monk must look for peace within himself and not in any other place. For when a person is inwardly quiet, there is nowhere a self can be found. Where then could a non-self be found? There are no waves in the depths of the ocean. It is still unbroken. It is the same with the monk. He is still without any quiver of desire, without a remnant on which to build pride and desire. Sir, said the questioner, you have explained with clear words and with open eyes the way that removes all dangers. Could you please tell me now about the practices of the path, the rules that must be kept, and also about the development of concentration? And the Buddha replied, A monk keeps his eyes from wandering restlessly with desire, and his ears are deaf to chatter and gossip. He has no longing for new sweets to taste, nor has he any desire to possess things in the world as his own. Where he is in contact with sense impressions, he should not become sorrowful or sad. He should not begin to wish for some other kind of life or tremble when confronted with fearful things. When he is given rice and other food to eat or milk to drink or clothes to wear, then as a monk he should not begin to store them up and he should not be anxious if he does not get any of them. He has to become a man of meditation, not a loiterer and a man without any regrets or laziness. He is a monk, and sitting or lying down, he spends his time in his quiet living place. He should not sleep too much, and he should, and he should make constant effort to be watchful whilst he is awake. Laziness, deception, laughter, games, sexual intercourse, ornaments, all these he has to give up. He does not study the practice of magic and spells. He does not analyze dreams and signs in sleep and movements in the zodiac. As one of my followers, he should not spend time interpreting bird songs or curing infertility or selling medicines and cures. Stop here for a moment. Huh? All these are considered wrong livelihood huh? for a monk. We saw in uh, Diga Nikaya. The monk should not be perturbed by criticism or impressed by praise. There is no place for greed in him. Hoarding, anger, and slander are emotions he has to discard. He should not get involved in buying and selling, and he should learn not to blame anything on other people. When he meets people in the village, he must not speak to them in the hope of getting some reward. He should not boast, should not speak carelessly, should not train himself in impudence or utter quarrelsome talk. The monk should not speak falsehood. He should not willfully commit dishonest deeds. He should not look down upon another, feeling proud of his livelihood, wisdom, or observance of rules and rituals. And when he hears other wondrous and ordinary people using angry words, he does not retort with harsh speech, for men of goodness do not answer back. Understanding this norm, the inquiring monk should train himself, being constantly mindful when the realization comes that peace can be found in the state of calm, then he should apply himself completely to the teaching of Gautama. He is the undefeated conqueror. He saw with his own eyes the way things are. He did not borrow it from tradition. So with constant diligence and respect, the monk should apply himself to the teaching of this master. The next sutta, 4.15. Atta Danda Sutta Fear results from resorting to violence. Just look at how people quarrel and fight. But let me tell you now of the kind of dismay and terror that I have felt. Seeing people struggling like fish writhing in shallow water with enmity against one another, I became afraid. At one time, I had wanted to find some place where I could take shelter but I never saw any such place. There is nothing in this world that is solid at base, 
and not a part of it that is changeless. I had seen them all trapped in mutual conflict, and that is why I had felt so repelled. But then I noticed something buried deep in their hearts. It was, I could just make it out, a dart. It is a dart that makes its victims run all over the place. But once it has been pulled out, all that running is finished, and so is the exhaustion that comes with it. These are the things we can learn from. The bonds of the world should not be pursued. Disenchanted with all sense pleasures, one should train oneself in calmness. A man of wisdom should be truthful, without arrogance, without deceit, not slanderous and not hateful. He should go beyond the evil of greed and miserliness. To have your mind set on calmness, you must take power over sleepiness, drowsiness and lethargy. There is no place for laziness and no recourse to pride. Do not be led into lying. Do not be attached to forms. You must see through all pride and fare along without violence. Do not get excited by what is old. Do not be contented with what is new. Do not grieve for what is lost or be controlled by desire. I call this craving, the greed, a great flood, and the hankering I call attachment, hanging up. This bog of lust is difficult to cross, but the man of wisdom stands on solid ground. He is like a brahmana, never moving from truth, and when he has completely renounced, then indeed is he calm. He has wisdom, he has complete knowledge, he has understood the way things are. He is completely independent. In his perfect wanderings from place to place, he has no envy for anyone. Desire is a chain, shackled to the world, and it is a difficult one to break. But once that is done, there is no more grief and no more longing. The stream has been cut off, and there are no more chains. Let there be nothing behind you. Leave the future to one side. Do not clutch at what is left in the middle. Then you will become a wanderer and calm. When a man does not identify himself with mind and matter at all, when he does not grieve for what does not exist, then he cannot sustain any loss in this world. When he does not think this is mine or that belongs to them, then since he has no egoism, he cannot grieve with the thought of, I do not have. If you ask me to describe a man who is unshakable, I say that where there is no harshness, where there is no greed, no trace of desire, and when a man is the same in all circumstances, then you have what I would call the praiseworthy condition of a man, unshakable. A man of discernment, without a flutter of desire, does not accumulate. He has no conditioning. He has stopped all effort of every kind. So everywhere he sees peace and happiness. The wise man does not rate himself with the distinguished, the lowest, nor with ordinary people. Calm and unselfish, he is free from possessiveness. He holds on to nothing and he, and he rejects nothing. Mm, this is a very high standard, no? the Buddha. Mm. Last Sutta and the chapter... 4.16, Sariputta Sutta. Well, Sariputta said, Neither have I seen nor has anyone heard of such a sweet tongue master coming down from the Tusita heaven to the midst of the many. The one with vision appears as he really is to the world of men and gods, and having dispelled all darkness, he alone attained happiness. Here from the many I have come supplicatingly with a question for the Buddha, who is unattached, a guileless teacher who has arrived in the world. The monk who abhors the world will seek out a lonely lodging under trees, in mountain caves. To him who delights in these various lodgings, what dangers are there? The monk does not tremble in his quiet dwelling. How many dangers are there in the world to be overcome by a monk, living in solitary dwellings? and going towards the region of immortality. What are his words? What are his objects in this world? What are the virtues and practices of the energetic monk? What is the training he has to undertake 
so that being concentrated, wise and mindful, he may remove his own impurities as a smith removes the dross from silver. And the Buddha said, Sariputta, to you who are disgusted with the world, who delight in a solitary dwelling and desire perfect enlightenment in accordance with the Dhamma, I will tell what I have realized. The monk who is wise, mindful, and who wanders in the limitations is not afraid of the five dangers, namely gadflies and other flies, snakes, men of ill will or animals. He is not afraid of heretics, even when he has seen the dangers from them. Furthermore, he who is a seeker of good will overcome other dangers too. He endures cold and excessive heat, even if he is affected by sickness and hunger. Affected by them in many ways, and being homeless, make strong exertions. Let him not steal, let him not speak lies, let him touch with loving kindness those who are feeble or strong. When he is aware that his mind is agitated, let that agitation be driven away by knowing that it belongs to the baser side. Let him not fall under the influence of anger or arrogance. Let him stay by having uprooted these, and let him overcome both what is pleasant and what is unpleasant. Guided by wisdom, with noble joy, overcoming dangers, let him dispel discontent in his distant solitude. Let him overcome the four lamentations. What shall I eat, or where shall I eat? I slept last night uncomfortably indeed. Where shall I sleep tonight? Let the aspirant who wanders or aspirant who wanders about homeless subdue these lamentable thoughts. Having received in due time both food and robes, he knows moderation in worldly matters for the sake of contentment. Guarded in these things and restrained while wandering in the village, even if he is offended by people, he never utters a harsh word. He who walks about with downcast eyes, not loitering, devoted to meditation, should be very watchful. Having acquired equanimity with a composed mind, he should cut off base and discursive thoughts and remorse. Let him welcome the words of reproof mindfully. With words of reproach, let him break stubbornness in his fellow monks. Let him utter wise words at a proper time. Let him not think detractingly of vulgar people. Then let him mindfully train to discipline the five kinds of pollution in the world, namely passion for forms, sounds, tastes, smells, and touch. Let the monk who is mindful with well-liberated mind subdue the desire for these things. Then investigating the Dhamma thoroughly, and with concentration, he will destroy the darkness of ignorance. That's the end of the sutta. All these suttas, huh, you see, uh, very good advice. Lah. More for monks lah, on how to practice the holy life. Huh. You can see the standards are very high. Lah. Anything to discuss? I think by tomorrow night we'll be finishing this uh, sutta nipata. Then we go on to the Dhammapada. Yeah, the photostatic Dhammapada. Can you explain about uh, what is the cause of the mindfulness? Uh, where is that page? Uh, page 100. Page 100. Page 100. Uh, verse what? Uh, this mindfulness holds him pose in a constant evenness, even mindedness. Uh, means uh, equanimity, I think. Even minded means uh, the, the mind does not move. Uh, equanimous. Uh. Uh, 
benefit having better formal religious practices all together and fashions so good and better. I think I think of the terminology what do you mean by formal religious practices? I guess during the Buddha's time, uh, there were a lot of these uh, religious practices uh, and uh, that day we saw the uh, DVD uh, on this uh, Tenzin Pam, Pamo and uh, you find like in Tibetan Buddhism, they have a lot of formal religious practices, uh, the uh, chanting, uh, learning debates, uh, rituals, the mudras, uh, hand movements, uh, all kinds. Uh. So all these, uh, actually these are called, you know, the word sila, bata, paramasa. Sila, bata, the sila is a moral conduct or precepts la, or rules. La. And the vata, bata is actually vata, v-a-t-a. La. The vata means any religious practice. La. So here, um, a lot of this religious practice uh, is uh, is like rituals, la, Another word of it, uh, another word for it, uh, is rituals, la. Uh. Uh, the Buddha said uh, that uh, he has no close fist of a teacher. La. So there's, uh, in the Buddha's teachings, uh, nothing should be secret. La. And also, uh, the Buddha in some sutta said uh, that uh, what is uh, Dhamma, what is uh, truth, uh, is open for everybody to see. La. The Dhamma Vinaya is open for everybody to see. Uh. Just like the the sun and the moon uh, is for everybody to see, la. In the same way, the Buddha's teachings uh, are every yeah are for everybody, la. There should, should be no secret, secret. La. Uh, so, uh, in conflicts, la, conflicts with the earliest uh, Buddhist teaching, la, that uh, teachings uh, should be passed uh, from teacher uh, directly to. The disciple are uh, secret, secretly. Uh. Mm. The Buddha says, uh, if anything is, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, in accordance with Dhamma, then it is not secretive. Uh. If something is secretive, uh, then it's uh, likely to be uh, deviant, uh, not in accord with the Dhamma. Uh. Because if it's in accord with the Dhamma, there's nothing to hide. So why should there, why should it be secret? Uh? Uh, you you only want it to be secret uh, if you have something to hide. Uh, that's why the Buddha calls it deviant uh, chair. Not the Buddha's way, la. If it uh, sounds a bit like uh, secret teachings, uh, um, teaching should always be open. Uh, just that uh, if some people are considered uh, not able to understand, uh, then you don't teach at all. No? If you teach, uh, then uh, it should be to to the crowd of people who are present. Uh, uh, not call a uh, few aside uh, to 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 them, uh, so it doesn't sound like in accordance with the Buddha's teachings. Uh. Okay, shall we end here?